morning, everyone, and thank you guys for joining us today. Sorry about the short delay. Um, we have a second great webinar with Astonish ready for you. My name is Jamie, and I'm with the Statewide Internet Portal Authority. Today, our partners at Astonish are guiding us through a second session of Cybersecurity Foundations. But this time, we're focusing on one of the most successful cybersecurity threats, social engineering. Jason, Program and Account Manager with Astonish, will be taking the lead on this webinar, accompanied by Earl, Sales and Marketing Coordinator with Astonish. I would like to mention, before we get started, that for this webinar you are muted. If you have questions or would like to communicate with the presenter at any point during the webinar, please use the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. There will be time at the end of the webinar um, for us to answer any questions you might have. Again, feel free to leave questions or comments in the comment box in the lower left-hand corner during the presentation. And with that, I think we're ready to go. So go ahead, Jason, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we start off here with a, a quick poll uh, to uh, just see whether or not anybody joined us for the first Cybersecurity Foundations webinar that we gave last month. Uh, and anybody who's able to, to answer on that one, we can uh, kind of get an idea of, of the, where we stand in the series here. I'm going to go ahead and skip over to uh, the results now. We got uh, several new people in here, so again, thank you for joining. Appreciate you taking the time out today. Uh, so to start off, um, I'm Jason Bove with Astonish. This is a Cybersecurity Foundation's social engineering topic for today. Um, for our agenda, we'll go into a little bit about Astonish and a little bit about CIPA. Uh, I'll uh, do a brief introduction on myself, and then we'll jump right into the content uh, about social engineering. We'll go over the different types of attacks. Uh, how to prevent those different types of attacks, uh, some stories of impact both on the national scale and uh, a little bit more that are local, uh, and then we'll go through what uh, we call pre-mortem exercise, which is really one of the best defenses uh, against uh, social engineering, preparing yourself for those types of attacks. So without further ado, we'll jump right in. First, a little bit about Astonish. We are a managed IT services, contact center solutions, and, and IT talent acquisition organization. Uh, pretty small company located in South Denver here. Uh, we've had about three decades worth of work uh, with different levels of, of IT solutions, all the way up to enterprise and all the way down to just a few computers in an office. Uh, for over 10 years, we've really been serving a lot of the public sectors across the state, over 150 locations physically across the state we're able to be in, usually in about two hours. We're proud to be uh, headquartered in Colorado, and Annette you know, Quintana is our CEO. Our mission, and, and that's really where the, the, um, the opus for these uh, webinars comes from is at Astonish, our singular goal is to help individuals, organizations, and our community be great. And we just happen to use technology to do that. So this is one of our ways that we want to help our technology um, partners and on our, our customers to be a little bit more advanced on, on the technology and, and cybersecurity front. So with the CIPA and Astonish partnership, we've been um, a partner with CIPA for some time now, and, and we have several different solutions. Really anything that we do on our managed services side can uh, be procured through CIPA. Uh, of course, the state, Statewide Internet Portal Authority uh, is, is what CIPA stands for, Colorado's source for no and low cost efficient and secure technologies for local and state governments. Uh, our uh, our uh, purpose is really aligned very well. It's a really uh, good partnership that we have. Uh, we uh, are able to, to, like I said, get our portfolio of services through CIPA, and a lot of the other partners are able to make for a pretty robust offering. And unlike typical vendors, procuring services and software through CIPA does not take an RFP, so it's a lot of uh, easy procurement, a um, uh, lot less expensive to get services through CIPA. Now about me, uh, I've been in IT for about 22 years. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in the federal and local public sectors as well as private sectors. 
I've uh, worn several hats in my professional career from IT operations delivery and management up to project and program management and account management uh, is my most recent role here at Astonish. Uh, specializations and interests include cybersecurity and infrastructure, uh, assessment and strategy. So with that into our content, social engineering. In short, basically, it's tricking people. It is the act of an unauthorized party manipulating an authorized party to gain access to, control over, damage, or to steal resources. And why do people do it? Well, it's pretty easy. It's, uh, technology is getting better and better, uh, but people still kind of have the same faults. We inherently want to trust. We uh, have emotional responses. So um, really, it's a lot easier and less expensive to hack people than it is information technology. So there are basically three types of attacks that we're going to go over in this presentation, physical, virtual, and telephone-based. We'll get into those in a little bit more detail here. First is the physical attacks. Now, the physical attacks are uh, usually done by uh, impersonation, uh, possibly tailgating, that's somebody just following uh, an authorized individual into a controlled location. Uh, also, open opportunities, whether it's open doors, uh, open computers, um, deliveries uh, potentially. Could be bribes, both in and outside of the workplace. Or it could be a media plant. It could be just that somebody puts a USB drive or a um, flash storage device or uh, possibly delivers it and it gets into your physical location that way. Uh, and that's the way you're able to um, get in and um, really cause some, some havoc there. So in order to prevent those attacks, um, first and foremost, the best um, defense is going to be user education. Uh, don't be afraid to empower your people to ask somebody who's walking around the workplace, even if it's a public place, is there anybody I can help you find? Is there something I can do for you? A lot of times we found that people are afraid just to ask those simple questions. Uh, in terms of employees that may be coming in, um, go through a good vetting process. Um, you might even implement an ID verification process, especially if uh, it's a controlled environment where you just take some quick information. There isn't anyone who's visiting in an official capacity that shouldn't be afraid to show ID or give you the name of the individual specifically uh, with whom they've coordinated to be there. Uh, implementation of video surveillance is also a relatively low-cost solution, depending on the, the area you need to surveil. Uh, also, physical security policy. Who do you allow in to what areas uh, and why? Uh, that could, should correspond with a good, solid IT security policy. Uh, on who you allow access to the information technology assets. Uh, and then you should really just wrap it all up with some social engineering testing. One of the things that we do during our assessment is that we uh, walk in and we say we're from an internet provider. We say we're from Comcast or CenturyLink. And that we just need to be able to check out the circuit or the link because we've had some problems reported. Um, and that's something that you'd be surprised how often we're able to, to gain access to an environment. So I'd like to go over some phishing examples um, and just to make sure everybody knows uh, what we're on the same page here. There's basically three different types of phishing I'm going to cover here. Just a regular phishing. That could be a free Cadoba, could be a DHL tracking number that you need to click on, a resume that you need to open, maybe an overdue bill that they're saying that you need to pay. Um, spear phishing is a little bit more targeted. Uh, that's one where it's an email impersonating a specific employee. For example, a finance director asking for a wire transfer. Whaling is one where it's uh, like spear phishing, but it's specifically targeted to a high-level personnel, so your C-level, uh, CFO, CEO, something along those lines, trying to get that big fish. So for those virtual attacks, phishing is really the, the main way of, of going about it. Uh, you're having people that are clicking on uh, email links, um, and one of the uh, real popular um, methods that people use is what I call fake links or almost links. Now, um, if you look at the two links that are on the screen, they look like they're uh, both legitimate and they both look like they're exactly the same. But what you might not notice is both of the L's in the lower link are actually capital I's. Now, you'll be able to see that, and uh, usually if you hover over a link or uh, if you're an email or on a web page, 
that should show up in all lowercase where you'll be able to pick out those sorts of things, but it takes that extra bit of, of looking. If you were to come across this in an email, um, you'd probably think it was uh, perfectly legitimate. Um, there's also the act of reverse engineering, which is basically when an attack is reported to your organization by a party who is offering to help you resolve your issue, but really the only intent is to gain access to your environment. So that's one you've got to look out for. Uh, and especially when you're looking at the links, you've got the HTTPS, those are usually going to have a certificate associated with them, and those certificates are going to kick out warnings. Um, we'll go th through what some of those warnings look like a little bit later. So for prevention, again, the number one is going to be your user education. Uh, there's really no better defense against most of these than that. You got also some hardware or tools that you can use. Some of them um, are relatively uh, low expense. Next-gen firewalls, for example, are, are getting pretty affordable. Uh, we recommend strong, unique passwords. I know there's a lot of pushback on these, having to have these really complex passwords. Uh, but there are ways and mechanisms that you can teach to your, your users uh, to have them use and deploy strong, unique passwords and not be something that's difficult to, to remember. We also recommend phishing campaigns. Uh, we've seen uh, an average uh, response rate on phishing campaigns that are sent out. Um, we have a partner that does these for us. Usually the click rate is about 45 percent. Uh, for organizations that have annual phishing campaigns that they kick off with their employees, we see that lower to say 7 to 10 percent, but again, it's not 100 percent, so uh, it's important to keep that up. Also, as I mentioned earlier, really heed those certificate warnings. Make sure that you notice when something doesn't look uh, legitimate. Um, it's helpful to be a little bit suspicious. If you have a question, just call. It's always a good idea to ask the question instead of uh, um, wondering about uh, whether or not you're letting somebody in who's legitimate. Um, also, vendor vetting. Again, don't be afraid to ask that vendor or whoever is visiting uh, for credentials. Who are you here to visit? Uh, who did you arrange the visit with? Just to make sure that it's uh, actually a legitimate visit. So, uh, going into some telephone attacks. So, uh, these ones um, are usually deploying the same types of tactics that we see in other organizations. Emotional attacks. You inherently would like to help people who are being pleasant to you. So you uh, often see that the actors are trying to be overly pleasant and overly nice. Uh, on the flip side of that, they might be trying to induce some panic, some stress. If I don't really get into my account immediately to get this resolved, I'm going to get in big trouble. I'm going to drag you down with me. They might use fear or anger. They use those emotional responses in order to try to get some information. Uh, so phonations is fake donations, somebody calling and asking for donations when they really aren't calling from the organization. Best way to give if you want to do that is to seek out the organizations yourself instead of just giving when you receive a telephone call. Robo phishing, these are the ones that I'm sure we've all received. There's a problem with your credit card account. There's a problem with your Microsoft Windows machine and we need to be able to connect you with an analyst to resolve the problem immediately. Uh, those ones, uh, don't trust. If uh, you have any questions, again, just call your, your IT department, um, ask around, see whether or not it's actually legitimate. Um, possibly the most alarming type of telephone attacks that we've seen recently are cell phone impersonation. Now, if you've got a uh, two-factor authentication set up, sometimes it's handy to be able to verify that you are indeed the person that you're claiming to be by having the organization, whether it's a bank or some other type of institution, send you a challenge response on your cell phone via text message. Well, what we're seeing is that uh, we'll have an actor go to a cellular provider, claim that your telephone number is actually their telephone number, and they want to switch from T-Mobile to Sprint or from AT&T to Verizon. And then they gain access and control over your phone number then they go and request a two-factor authentication to regain access to your financial institution, and they're in. So for prevention, the all too popular user education, also number one here. Uh, have a good telephone information policy in your organization. What is it okay to give over the telephone? Uh, what is not? Uh, we recommend uh, that if you do give names, be suspicious over what names you, you may give. Um, don't give full names, don't give addresses, phone numbers, uh, and of course all of the other stuff. Just do a gut check. 
Uh, make sure that you know for sure whether or not the information you're able to give is um, going to the person you intend it to go to. Um, don't be afraid to uh, validate information. Uh, if they're giving you some information claiming to be a part of your organization or a part of an institution that you do business with, uh, validate that information. If they are requesting a call back, uh, there are many telephone numbers out there that simply by calling the number you will be charged a fee. Um, and so that's one where we really recommend that there's um, uh, a, a information policy and if you don't call uh, back those um, that are requesting a callback. Uh, when in doubt, hang up, that's a good one too. And for that cell phone impersonation, instead of using two-factor via SMS or text message, um, it might be a good idea to um, uh, use a two-factor application. So the next one here, uh, these are the different lists of the two-factor or the uh, social engineering prevention, including the two-factor application, uh, one that we really recommend, user education uh, being chief among all of these. Uh, and then a hardware or tools. If you just implement a next-gen firewall, again, some of these are getting very affordable, and the defenses that they give for you are, are very, very good. So we recommend looking into those. Uh, there are several very um, powerful tools that you can use. Uh, potentially a uh, secure email gateway service is one to look into. Uh, we recommend that you run regular campaigns or tests of your personnel. Uh, and that's not an attempt to just catch people or embarrass people. It's, it's a, a real true effort to get stronger. And not just stronger at work, but stronger at home too. Because what we've seen is that IT and computing behaviors that are popular at work are also popular at home and vice versa. So if you can make somebody stronger at work, you're also protecting them at home as well. Be very, very, very wary of emotionally charged requests information verification, request to, to share information, or reset passwords, anything along those lines. Um, leverage those next-gen firewalls, encryption, secure email gateway. Uh, but when in doubt, just call IT, ask the questions, ask around. So to get into some impact stories, I first wanted to start with a, a relatively large one that recently happened. It was a CEO impersonation. Uh, where the email came through uh, requesting large wire transfers. It was a financial impact. The total impact for Ubiquity Networks for this uh, specific social engineering attack was $46.7 million. Very large, very widespread. One that's a little bit more local is a uh, public sector in the northwest part of the state. This was one where uh, the department director was uh, sent a phishing link uh, and it kicked off a ransomware attack. So she clicked on the link and because she was the director, uh, this was one that actually infected the server. Now they had a contract with us, so thankfully we were able to remediate this, but it did take a long time due to bandwidth restrictions in the area and pulling down those solid backups. Uh, so the total potential impact between our remediation efforts and lost wages for that relatively small organization, it was uh, 10 employees and two supervisors, was 12 and two thirds thousand dollars. It was uh, quite a, uh, could have been quite a large impact. Next one is a uh, private organization. This was a small uh, early childhood education uh, organization in Denver, Colorado. This one was also email based and it was an impersonation of the CEO. Uh, it appeared to be sent from the CEO, but instead of being sent from a dot com, it was sent from a dot org email uh, or a dot uh, com address instead of a .org email address. Uh, this financial impact was averted because thankfully the individual who received this on the financial side uh, had been educated in these spoofing techniques and uh, did not send that $5,000 that was being requested to be wired over. Next one was another. This was a small town in northern Colorado. Uh, this was uh, uh, impersonation of the finance director, another email based. Uh, this financial impact was averted and not because it was caught at the organization level. This one actually went to the bank and the bank called back to the, the small town and said, this looks a little fishy. Are you sure that this is legitimate? Uh, and ended up saving the town about $15,000 instead of that being wired over. So again, the wire actually went all the way to the bank, but the bank was the one that caught it. So it'd be nice to be able to catch those earlier. 
and user education is a key. Uh, relatively popular ransomware delivery mechanism recently has been a, a resume ransomware. It was pretty widespread. This continues to just kind of go around. It pops up every once in a while. Various targets on this one, it's email based. Uh, does kick off a, a ransomware. The so total impact uh, so far has been in the several million dollar range uh, because when you receive this, this vague email, hi, my resume is attached, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, most people just go ahead and open that link. Who is this person? What's going on here? Uh, we're curious by nature. Unfortunately, this one uh, uh, kicks off a ransomware attack and um, has a payout that has to be done. Uh, by the way, we do recommend that if you ever get the, a victim of ransomware, don't pay the ransom. There's no guarantee you're going to get your files back, um, and um, it's better to just have a, a good business continuity or disaster recovery plan in place to prevent that and, and user education to hopefully prevent the ransomware from even taking hold. Next one here is a financial institution. It was an online uh, cryptocurrency wallet site called My Ether Wallet. They basically impersonated this site by hacking into the domain name service, which is basically the post office uh, for the internet that tells traffic where to go, what IP address, what server, etc. So the hackers in this instance set up a fake server that looked exactly like the server uh, for this particular uh, service. So it was a web-based attack, the financial impact. This was one where anybody who went to that site, it was an HTTPS site, so uh, secure, but it kicked out a certificate warning. Total impact on this one was $365,000. This happened, I think, just last month, maybe even this month. Um, but the certificate warning would have been pretty easy to catch. Here's an example of what it looked like in Internet Explorer, what would have popped up for those users who were going to that. Uh, so there's a problem with the website security certificate. In Chrome, would have looked a little different would have looked like we've got, uh, this is probably not the site you were looking for, that type of a warning, um, and warning you that uh, it was not the legitimate server. So make sure you pay attention to those, heed those, and, and get those out to your people who, who may be victims of clicking on inofficial links. Last impact one I want to go over was, it was a perfect classic example of uh, social engineering. Uh, Kevin Mitnick is a popular name in the cybersecurity realm. He was a black hat hacker uh, during the, I believe, 80s and 90s, but was caught. Uh, in a sense, kind of turned into a, a kind of a white, white hat hacker, gives a lot of really good information on how he was able to do what he did. Uh, one thing that he did bad, back when he was wearing his black hat was impersonation. He basically called up Motorola. Uh, he was interested in cellular technology. So he wanted to figure out how the things worked, so he decided to get the source code. Uh, it's very valuable, it's a very protected intellectual property, uh, definitely not something you can just buy. So he just called on his walk home uh, the 800 number for a Motorola and in 20 minutes was able to get the source code simply by using telephone and the gift of gab. Uh, so this is a really good example. You can have a really solid cybersecurity posture with really good tools and really good services, uh, but all it takes is one very clever individual to be able to pull one over on really the weakest link in any organization, which is the users. So now I'd like to do a, a poll question. Um, we'd like to ask, what was the financial impact of just over 40,000 cases of email-based social engineering recorded by the FBI between October 2013 and December 2016. I'm going to bring that poll up and uh, see, it looks like it cut the question off here, but again, what was the impact of those 40,000 cases between October 2013 and December 2016? If I can get some responses there, then we'll move on to uh, see what the, uh, the result was. Okay, last call for any answers. Excellent, we'll go to the results here. So it looked like uh, most people thought it would probably be in that uh, $5 trillion range, a couple in the $5 million, one in the $50. Um, but it looks like we, uh, we had uh, most people give the right answer. It was $5 trillion, $302 million, almost $303 million. That's an average of $131,903 per case. 
so that's why I chose uh, social engineering as the, the first um, one of these specific attack vectors that I wanted to cover in detail. Uh, very prolific, uh, very effective, and that's why it's still used. So I uh, wanted to go over a pre-mortem exercise, and I love this picture here because you know, we want to play the role of the brown cow in this picture. We want to take a look and ask ourselves, how did we get here before it happens? Uh, so first we want to define a plan. We want to uh, take a look and make sure everybody's on the same page on what that plan needs to be. We need to identify what the failure was in this exercise, and then we, we need to brainstorm on what the the failure reasons were, and then we need to share all of those reasons. Uh, we really encourage people to just share anything that, that they can think of. Then to go uh, through and prioritize those reasons, make sure to take a look at um, the ones that are the, the highest priority, taking a look at both impact and, and urgency of those different reasons, and then create an action plan around those, and then assign tasks. So the idea is to, before you're the victim of a social engineering attack, go through this exercise. We recommend you do it for both your physical social engineering risks, your virtual social engineering risks, and of course those telephone-based risks. To go through one of those, um, just wanted to kind of give an example. Fishing, since it is by far the most popular, it's a numbers game, uh, the actors in this situation send out millions upon millions of emails, and if just a few of those click, then uh, they get a very, very hefty return on their investment. So in this one, you sit down with all of your department heads, all of your um, individuals who are going to weigh in on this exercise. And this can be done just over a brown bag lunch. Sit down and uh, just hand out some post-it notes and have everybody really kind of on the same page first and foremost. We're going to establish a plan for an email phishing breach. So we're going to make believe it happened. We got breached. It was an email phishing campaign. Uh, we had one or more people click on it, um, and we fell victims to this thing. Uh, so we need to um, take a look. The uh, situation was that an internal personnel uh, clicked on the phishing link. Uh, and so everybody sits down and, and lists the reasons for this occurrence. Why is it that somebody clicked on the link? How is it that the link was able to even get through? Uh, what could um, uh, be the full scope of reasons why this would, would happen? Then just share everyone's list. Put up those post-it notes on a wall and have everybody collaboratively prioritize those reasons. Think of impact. This is, uh, okay, it was a ransomware, and, and it infected all of our intellectual property, all of our sensitive files, all of our financial files. Um, or maybe it was something that just... Uh, attacked all of our uh, archived files. Um, and based on those different types of impacts, what's the urgency? Of course, if it have encrypted all of your current financial files, the urgency is going to be pretty high. If it just encrypted uh, your backups, then the urgency might be a little bit lower. So then you create a plan to mitigate those top, say, three to five reasons for the breach. And you'll be surprised a lot of these you can do uh, just by uh, trying to leverage those tools that aren't going to cost you a ton of money. Do the user education. Do the phishing campaigns. Um, do the uh, tests of social engineering, somebody walking in and actually trying to gain access to your system, that kind of thing. So then assign to, uh, tasks, whether it's the, the user training. Somebody looks into that and comes back with good um, uh, options for some good training. Uh, maybe implementation of, of policies. One uh, simple way to prevent uh, some of the ransomware from kicking off is to create a, a group policy in your organization that uh, disallows executables that are downloaded from the web. Uh, that could be a driver update, or that driver update could actually have been hacked and contain ransomware. So even if you're pulling it down from Dell, HP, looks like a legitimate uh, download, uh, but it's trying to execute and it actually is something that contains a, a package from a bad actor. Uh, so make sure you get those policies in place to just make it to where if there's executables uh, going off that it's being done by a legitimate uh, person and from a legitimate source. Another one, NextGen Firewall, as I mentioned. A lot of these do have intrusion protection, intrusion prevention, uh, has a lot of good uh, malware filtering, uh, and will take a lot of those suspicious messages and trash them. The good next-gen firewalls behave a lot like a good endpoint protection. That's your 
Symantec, McAfee, Webroot, whatever flavor you have, uh, used to be in the old days that these were updated about once a month. Then they got down to about once a week. Now they're updating about every 15 minutes, and there are a lot of labs across the uh, United States that look at those. Uh, one statistic that we read from one of our favorite uh, labs here at Astonish, uh, FortiGuard Labs, was that over 80% of malware is targeted for the individuals. So that's like that spear phishing or that whaling attack. That's something that has been targeted based on the type of organization you are, a specific person in your organization, or a specific weakness of your organization. And so with that level of sophistication, they're doing it because it works. You've got to really be vigilant. You've got to have a, a highly trained user base, um, and hopefully you can help prevent some of those breaches going forward. So with that, I'll go on to the uh, Q&A section here. Um, and then, Jamie, I, th I think that you might have a, a slide that, that you wanted to end up on. I don't know if you want to end up on this one uh, or another one, but you can take over and, and put it on the slide that you'd like. But uh, we'd like to see if there are any questions, and you can put those into the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And hopefully we can awesome. get some answers for you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to throw it over on here. Um, so again, the chat box is available for questions. We'll give it a couple minutes so that folks can kind of digest and put them in there as they want. Um, I do have a couple already, so we'll wait a minute, and then we will start uh, to answer those. If that's all right with you, Jason? Yep, sounds good to me. All right, so it looks like our first question. Um, someone's curious, do you find that the size of an organization corresponds with a certain type of attack? For example, are larger organizations more susceptible to tailgating um, or to phishing? Uh, statistically, we've seen that that, that is the, the case. Um, we look at the industries especially that are most targeted, and they're your industries where usually the companies are a little bit larger. Uh, financial services, healthcare being at the top of the list. But especially in our work across the state of Colorado with SIPA and uh, with some of the work that we do with counties, um, state parks, different towns and, and organizations across the state, we've seen that they're all targeted. Uh, and they're all targeted in a pretty direct fashion. We're talking about bad actors that, that research the organization, find out who um, are the uh, decision makers, who would be the ones that would send a request for a wire transfer, would have access to the bank, the keys to the kingdom, uh, and those are the ones that are either spoofed on email or are the target of having their email attacked. And so uh, I think that, that, you know, as public institutions, you've got to have that information out there. You've got to have, you know, who's on the board who are in those positions of power so that the public knows who to contact in a lot of different cases. But unfortunately, that's a double-edged sword. Uh, it makes you the, the target of an attack simply because now they know who your financial person is. Now they know who is at the, uh, the top of the food chain, so to speak. And so that since they have those names, that availability of information makes it to where public organizations are more subject to an attack. And then the next one over here is, um, is there a source for known or popular or current social engineering tactics that people have fallen victim to, kind of like an ongoing updated index of, hey, look out for this, or be cautious when you see this? Yeah, I would actually defer to some of the different labs I mentioned. Um, NSS Labs does testing on cybersecurity, and they're looking at a lot of the different tools. And so, of course, in order to test the tools, they have to know the attacks. Um, just do a, a search on, on the web. The, the thing is that when you do that, um, it's like a map. As soon as you print it, as soon as they publish it out to the web, it's out of date. Uh, one of the more sophisticated attacks that we learned of recently uh, is that uh, they send an email to an organization requesting that you simply uh, verify your, your credentials by logging into your own um, webmail server. And of course, they provide you with a very handy link. The link looks legitimate, just like the example that I showed there. And it sends you to a webmail portal login that looks exactly like yours. And then here's the kicker. You put in your username, 
and your password, you log in, and it actually logs you into your email. So it looks like it was a perfectly legitimate request. Thing is that the web page that looked legitimate collected your username and password, used that to log you into your webmail, forwarded you there, and then kept your username and password for malicious intent later. Uh, so th that's just one example. These uh, cyber criminals are, are very, very smart, and it's the proverbial uh, mouse trap and, and smarter mouse situation. We have one more question, though, folks, if you do have another question, feel free to comment um, down in the lower left-hand corner. We might take just one more um, if we have time. Uh, so the next question is, the cybersecurity assessment is mentioned between SIPA and Astonish, and does that come with recommendations for user education relevant to the organization that had the assessment done? Yes, that's the case. What we t try to take a look at is based on the organization and the attacks that we've seen um, and the vulnerabilities that we find inside of the organization, we might recommend a, um, a user education for acceptable use over a phishing campaign. We might recommend a penetration test over a phishing campaign, something along those lines. Uh, but we try to, to keep into consideration uh, based on what we've seen and based on what we find uh, what's the best bang for the buck when it comes to user education? All right, and I, I had, oh, it looks like we just had uh, one more come in. Um, they ask, since end user training is the best source of prevention, where can I go to get training for myself or for my employees? Uh, that's a good question. It depends on the type of training that you're after. Uh, there are a lot of really solid organizations that provide this training. Um, there's a Secure the Human training uh, that is put on um, that is uh, really quite effective. Uh, there are several different uh, vendors that will do phishing campaigns uh, of various size and scope. Um, so the, the most important thing is to have regular training. Um, there is a lot of, of um, very clever phishing campaigns that are relatively low cost and say that you do those three times a year. Uh, and it's just a, kind of a one-time engagement, but it's spread out throughout the year. Maybe that you do just a uh, training on a different aspect each year. Um, there are a lot of really solid uh, webinars like the, the ones that, that we're uh, putting on here. Uh, but uh, nothing really beats when you, you actually uh, are able to illustrate where people are going in and um, inadvertently presenting a vulnerability to, to their organization or to themselves uh, just by uh, clicking into uh, a link or uh, something along those lines. Awesome. So it looks like we've finished up all the questions so far, um, but if you do find that you have more questions after we part, please don't hesitate to contact us at SIPA or contact Jason with Astonish. You'll find the contact information on the screen. There will also be an opportunity um, once we end here in just a moment to fill out a survey and put your questions in there and have someone reach out to you with that answer if you'd like. Um, if you want to return to this webinar to view it again or share it with a colleague, colleague keep a lookout for the post-webinar email with the link to the video on SIPA's YouTube channel. You can also view the past Cybersecurity Foundation session on SIPA's YouTube channel as well. Um, we really want to make these webinars as relevant and informational as possible, so it would be appreciated if you could just take one minute and fill out the survey following this webinar. Give some feedback to SIPA and to Astonish. It's short, but hopefully it will keep SIPA on track with being able to provide you with information that you are interested in. So to close, I want to thank you guys all for being with us. I especially want to thank Jason and Earl for taking the time uh, to hang out with us today and help us understand another piece of the cybersecurity world. Um, so thank you again, and look out for that email to be able to share this <coughs> webinar later. Thank you so much, Jason. Have a great day, all. Yeah, thanks, everyone.